Hi, I'm Jessica, and when I'm not drinking all the coffee, watching Razorback sports, or hanging out with my family of boys, it's my passion to help elementary music teachers just like you find your unique teaching style. My goal with this podcast is to share helpful tips, strategies, and to give you the motivation you need to gain momentum in your teaching so you can continue being the music teacher rock star you already are. Well, hey there, friends. Welcome back to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. This is episode 95 with Sarah Goulish. And you guys, you're in for an amazing treat because this woman is amazing. I'm telling you right now. I do not say that about everyone, and I think everyone's amazing, but honestly, I have truly connected with her. We've connected on Instagram, and the way I found her, actually, I don't know if she found me or I found her. Well, anyways, we just connected because I have a um, book I'm writing, and this I have not really actually talked about it much, and honestly, at the time of this recording, I don't know when it's going to be published, especially because of everything going on right now with the way our world is going with the virus that's the pandemic anyways. So anyways, I'm pretty strapped for time with writing, but anyways, we've connected on Instagram, and um, she has, lo and behold, has an amazing company called F Flat Books, which you're going to hear more about today, and she has helped me so much with the writing process. And so in our conversation we had, that was not this podcast episode, just in a different conversation we've had, um, we started talking about um, writing a book, what it's like, how it's different than writing blog posts, how it's different for writing things for your classroom, like curriculum or lesson plans. And the whole thought process behind it is different. But in the process of that conversation, we also talked about imposter syndrome as an author, like who am I to write this book? Who am I to teach that? Who would want to read what I have to write? And all those things that we think sometimes as teachers, authors, bloggers, podcasters, whatever, that you've probably thought before too. And if you haven't, then awesome, because I mean, have confidence and all. (laughs) But this uh, this episode is so great. Honestly, a lot of the questions I'm asking her are questions that I've thought myself. And so I thought if I'm having these questions, I know good and well some of you have had the thought before of, I would love to write a book. How do I write a book? What would I write about? Would people want to hear what I have to say? Or I have imposter syndrome. And we talk about both of those things, being a music education author and how did you get past imposter syndrome? And Sarah and I are both vulnerable in this episode about how we both have imposter syndrome still and how we move past those thoughts and feelings. I want to also um, start this episode by saying that the audio quality on my end, <laughs> I want to apologize ahead of time because when we recorded this episode was um, a day I had kind of rearranged where my desk was and the equipment I needed and I did not set the microphone up right. Um because I was in a different room anyway. So it's going to sound a little poorer quality than you're used to. And I just want you to know ahead of time that I am aware of that. And so I tried to edit it the best I could. So if you can get past the poor quality audio, um, that would be great. Just be understanding of that because I'm sorry. (laughs) But anyways, Sarah Goulish She has a PhD in music education from Temple University. For over a decade, she's taught secondary level music at Lower Moreland High School located in the state of Pennsylvania. She's also an adjunct professor of music education at Buffalo State University and Temple University. Her teaching centers on creativity and improvisation in courses focused on new music learners. She's an active researcher, writer, presenter, and clinician at the state, national, and international levels. She serves as the United States Representative for the International Society of Music Education's Popular Music Special Interest Group and is a past member of the National Association for Music Education's Innovations Council. She regularly tours and records as a rock musician with a variety of groups, and her experience as a popular musician has influenced her curricula and philosophy as a music educator and is detailed in her book, Creativity in the Music Classroom, an Innovative Approach to Integrate 
arts education. She works to provide authentic learning and performing experiences for adolescents both in and out of the classroom. And in 2019, she launched F Flat Books, a music publishing company focused on practical and affordable resources for musicians and music educators. She regularly contributes to the F Flat community blog, publishes her curricula for a variety of teaching settings on that platform, and her research interests include informal learning, creativity, popular music pedagogy, and student autonomy. Wow, I almost couldn't say that word. You guys are, like I said, this episode is amazing. And even if you're not interested in being a music education author, you will get so much from this episode, I promise, because we have so many conversations centered around so many different things related to being an author and imposter syndrome and just being a music teacher in general. So enjoy this episode, and I hope you get something from this. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. I am joined today by my friend, Sarah, who I actually met online because I think, you know, meeting people online is just the way to do things now. And we've just connected on um, so many different levels, but as educators and moms, and I've loved connecting with her. And I've been wanting to have her on the podcast for a long time. And you'll see why, because she's amazing and has so much to offer. But Sarah, I would love for you to just introduce yourself a little bit more and let everybody know what you do and who you are and all those good things. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Gulish, and I am a music teacher. I'm a public school music teacher. I've been teaching since 2007. I live in Philadelphia with my husband. I have three kids, ages five, three, and one, which is absolutely crazy. And I've been teaching since 2007, and I've actually taught everything. I thought about it today. I've taught early childhood I've taught elementary students. I've taught middle school general music and choir and band and orchestra. And right now I do uh, high school. I teach high school orchestra, guitar, and general music. And I also teach college students. So I have just, it feels like I've taught everything in music education and I love it. I love being a music teacher. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, and so I know you and I have had conversations about imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, in relation to so many different things, because I've had conversations with you recently about me writing a book. Um, and that's a lot of what you do in your company and everything. And so, but we were just talking about imposter syndrome and like, who would want to read my book? Who would, you know, want to listen to me? And so we're going to talk a lot about that in this episode. But the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about being an author, because I know if I have those feelings of who am I to write this. I know you work with so many authors of so many different backgrounds. And so I want to just talk a little bit about like the process for writing a book, simple steps you have for someone who might be thinking about doing this. Um, if they're feeling overwhelmed with getting started, just anything you have to share along those lines for our listeners today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Those are such good questions. So I should talk a little bit about my writing background. I did my PhD in music education and had to write a dissertation, which is very long, very exhaustive, and you basically get ripped apart throughout the whole process. So as you're writing, you're getting constant feedback, and then you have your committee. They all give you separate feedback. Um, So coming out of that, I feel like there's a sense of accomplishment, but then also a lot of doubt that goes into yourself as a writer and what you have to say. So the first time I had a book idea and I wanted to write it and I wanted to find a publisher, I went to a few different publishers, found one that accepted the project and just felt completely on my own. Um, I didn't have an advisor looking over my work. I didn't have people editing my work and that was really hard for me. So I get why people are overwhelmed by the idea of writing a book Um, and thinking through what was helpful for me. I think the first thing is just making sure that the first thing you really write is something you're absolutely passionate about. So my first full book was about something I felt so strongly about. It was a book about creativity in music education and um, it's based on a curriculum I developed with an art teacher. I had so much to say on the topic, so it wasn't hard for me to put words out there. Um, It was harder for me, I think, to go through the editing process, but I think finding a project that you're passionate about is 
super important because we all get sick of our work at some point. And so to push through, to really bring it to completion, you have to love what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And so that's one piece of advice I have. I always personally start with kind of a rough outline of whatever I want to talk about and uh, do what I call the word vomit stage. And I know that we've talked about that too. Finding the easiest part of, what, of whatever the topic is. So if I'm writing a book about creativity, for example, I might outline 10 different chapter ideas. I'm not necessarily going to start with chapter one. I'm going to start with the one that I feel the strongest about, that I have something to say about, and then just go for it mm. and then fill in the others as it comes. Um, and then really letting your words breathe before you go back and look at them again. I think one of our biggest issues is writing a bunch of stuff, immediately looking at it and thinking, this looks dumb. Does anyone even care about what I'm saying? Is this even valuable? And then we sort of uh, don't give it a chance to just breathe and have some space from it. So in terms of just getting started, I think those are my biggest tips. Yeah, those are good. And yeah, you said we've already had a conversation around that because when you and I talked, like I am in the beginning of stages, beginning stages of writing a book. Um, and I picked your brain one day and I said that I was like, but what about the formatting? And what about how many page numbers and what, you know, font should I use? And you're like, stop it. Yeah. You don't need to focus on all that. And when you told me to just word vomit and I was trying to go in order of the chapters mm -hmm. And some of them, it's like, I put the chapters down like an outline because I know what to say in those chapters, but some of them, I could just put the words down. And then some of them was like, what do I say here? Yeah. How do I know what to, you know? And so I like that you said that it's okay to skip around. So one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had was when I was writing my dissertation, which was a case study. And so there's a little bit more creativity in terms of how it's written versus, you know, a quantitative study that's by the book. And mm -hmm. I wrote the whole thing. So this is, you know, close to 200 pages of work. And my advisor said, you know what? I just think the order is all wrong. Print it out, lay it all on the ground and just redo the entire order. And this was maybe a couple of weeks before my defense. And I was like, this is the craziest thing <laughs> ever. I was so stressed out about it, but I did it. I did. I took her advice. And actually, my husband's a writer as well. He um, he writes for television. So he, he writes a children's TV show. But he has a great uh, mind for story. So I remember with my dissertation, even though he knew nothing about my field or what I was talking about, he was able to follow the story and mm -hmm. say, okay, here's what you need to make this a compelling story. And... And I think sometimes we lose that when we're just thinking in terms of these like segmented chapters and I have to start at the beginning, I have to get to the middle. Sometimes, you know, you'll start with a middle chapter and it will end up being your first chapter. So mm -hmm. I think trying to let go of your initial vision and really just getting into the work, crafting it, and then, you know, going back and revising it how you need to is so important. Right. So one thing I didn't talk to you about yet is, um, and this just kind of came to me. So I've written a lot of blog posts yeah. and I'm finding that that is completely different than writing a book because when I write a blog post, I write it with, um, obviously when you write a book, you do this too, with the reader in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but what I mean by that is I try to not tell, I tell a little bit about myself, but it's mostly like informational, like three simple steps to blah, 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 or whatever, you know, with a lot of information in it, but I'm noticing, um, I've kind of held back a little bit because I'm struggling with, and I know someone listening to this, who's writing a book probably wonders this too, is how much of yourself do you include in your book versus how much like a blog post information, um, or does that just kind of depend on what you're writing about and what, I don't know, how do you, how you want to write it? Yeah, it depends so much on the project, right? But I am such a fan of putting yourself in things mm -hmm. because I've seen the power of connection through that. And I was just talking to one of our authors last week. Um, she's a professor. She's working on a choral methods textbook. And she gave an example of herself failing in the book and was thinking of taking it out because someone else said, oh, you shouldn't show your weakness. And I said, mm. absolutely not. This is what makes you relatable. And so if I'm, let's say, a newly graduated 
music ed student and I'm looking for a book on general music, which is your area of expertise, I don't want to read a book from someone who comes across as having everything together and has never made a mistake. I want Mm -hmm. someone who will be real with me. And so I think being real involves sharing nuances of yourself. Um, So I'm always a fan of that. But again, if you're writing, you know, a strictly academic textbook and you're just reporting research, that might be different. Mm. Yeah, because there's a need for all different kinds of books, you know. Um, So I I like that you said that. It depends on what you're writing. Um, So what if someone is listening to this and they're thinking, that's all great. I've wanted to write a book, but what if no one really wants to hear what I have to say? And, you know, or that teacher over there could say it way better than I could. So who am I to write this book? I know you've you've told me that you've worked with authors who have said the same thing, um, or even music teachers you work with in their classroom. So how does a person get past that? Hmm. And to know what they have to say is valuable. Um, <laughs> I try to convince them. <laughs> I, yeah. You need someone on the outside who can look in on what you're doing. I don't know if I shared this with you, but um, it's kind of like songwriting. I was talking to an artist friend of mine about songwriting and she was telling me this piece of advice from an artist where um, when the art student was questioning, is this good or not? Mm -hmm. the art teacher said, well, that's none of your business. Mm. And just this idea that the work that we're putting out into the world, it's really not up to us if it's good or not, if it's valuable or not. Mm. Obviously we want to make it as best as it can be, but it's up to the consumer to add the value to it. And so if we have anyone in our life telling us you have something to say, then I think we really have to trust that and trust that for some people, we won't have the thing they need, but there will be someone out there who needs to hear what we have to say. And, you know, um, I think this really hit home. You were mentioning our our best-selling author, Danielle, uh, who's a middle school general music teacher. When I invited her to write for us for our company launch, she was super hesitant for those same reasons. Mm -hmm. And she's had the best results from her work people are loving what she's doing and I just think we're so blind to our own capacities oh yeah and imposter syndrome is a real thing and I kind of want to get into that because it's this is in relation to whether you're wanting to write a book or you're in you know a music teacher in the classroom um whatever an entrepreneur listening to this podcast or blog or whatever um whatever you're doing in relation to anything but in relation to music education because that's what we're talking about here what are some pieces of advice you have just about imposter syndrome in general for anyone listening okay well <laughs> i don't that's have a loaded question <laughs> yeah i'm not uh perfect in this area by any means i was thinking about this And I feel like any time imposter syndrome creeps up, it's because I'm looking at what someone else is doing, right? Mm -hmm. Don't you think so? It's that you're you're looking at what other people are doing and then the self-talk starts to be, I shouldn't be doing this. I have no place doing this. Someone could do it better. So there's a couple things that help for me and that I also try to share with the people I work with. One of the pieces of advice is, yeah, someone might be able to do some things better than you, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that your voice isn't valuable too. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, just because someone can speak well about elementary music education, we don't just want one voice about elementary music education. We want many voices to reach many people. The other thing is just doing a lot of digging and trying to find the root of it. So in those moments, if I'm feeling imposter syndrome, I'm feeling like I'm not adequate enough, what am I valuing as the number one piece of my identity? Yeah. It's usually in that moment misplaced. So if I think my identity is tied to me being the best orchestra director there ever was, then in those moments when I see someone doing a good job, it's going to crush me versus realizing that's part of who I am, but that not, isn't essentially who I am. Yeah. Um, and trying to ground myself in what is the most important things to me and what should I be caring deeply about? Yeah. Yeah. I think back to starting my career as an elementary music teacher and I remember sitting in different workshops and just meeting teachers who had been teaching longer than I have. And I was like, oh my gosh, 
I'm never going to match up to that. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, and it it even goes back to like college. You'd watch these people that, you know, they come back after student teaching, talking about their experiences. And I was like, I didn't have that experience today. Like maybe I shouldn't be doing this after all. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's anything in life. I feel like it's like, you compare yourself as a mom, a wife, a business owner, a teacher, whatever. It's just, I think it's, it's just like, part of, I don't know. It's hard, isn't it though? It's so hard. And it's like everything Brene Brown talks about where it's mm. just easier to not do it. It's easier to not put yourself out there and to yep. almost take pride in a lack of effort sometimes versus saying, I'm actually going to put myself out there and try something that I don't really know what I'm doing, but yeah. I'll give what I have to give. And you also realize no one actually knows what they're doing. I mean, if right. you listen to podcasts, like I listen to how I built this, where mm-hmm. you hear about entrepreneurs and how mm-hmm. they build their companies, no one knows what they're doing when they yeah. start a company at all. And so for me, that's so encouraging that none of us know what we're doing. We're figuring it out and mm-hmm. it's okay. Oh, it's so true. And I've had people like, I think they just think I just kind of knew what I was doing when I started even this podcast, I'm like, uh, y'all have no idea. Mm-hmm. Like go back and listen to episode one. It was just kind of me being like, Hey guys. Um, so <laughs> it's like, but I just put myself out there and that is, I feel like the scariest thing is just whether you're working with kids, with teachers, whoever, it's scary to put yourself out there because you're worried about other people's opinions. And you're exactly right. When I kind of put my blinders on, don't get me wrong, I'm aware of what else is out there because I think it's important. I share other teachers' work. I um, encourage them and uplift them and think it's important collaboration over competition. But I also, in that respect, think it's important to stay true to yourself Mm -hmm. and to kind of put your blinders on and know who you are and stay grounded so you're not constantly distracted like, oh, wait, they just did this. Maybe I should do that. Or maybe mine's not as good or you know, like, Oh, it's so crazy. Those thoughts, it's so hard. And so Mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, is just gonna, I don't know, I guess it just comes along and it's always, do you feel like it's like when you least expect it, you feel like you're doing totally fine. And then bam, you just all of a sudden we'll see one thing and it just like derails you a little bit. Yeah. And honestly, for me, I'm such a people pleaser and it really creeps up with strangers. (laughs) Like I worry more about what strangers think about me usually than people closest to me. Right. Why is that? (laughs) I don't know. But uh, yeah, if I get so starting a business and being on social media, putting my face on things is not was not in my comfort zone whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of my biggest fears is what do I do when I get negative feedback? And uh, my brother who runs the company with me, um, he's not in the field of music education. So he Mm -hmm. really doesn't take things personally at Mm -hmm. all if people criticize us, which is kind of nice to have that. Yeah, But, you know, we've gotten some pushback on some blog posts that we've posted that were controversial. And my initial response is, why am I doing this? I shouldn't be putting things out there. I shouldn't be sharing my ideas. And he's like, why don't you just thank them and ask them if they want to write a dissenting post for us? Like, oh, okay. And so that's kind of been our policy is, you know, we've had a few of these conversations where we've just welcomed the negative feedback and it really has just completely changed my mindset about it. Yeah. Negative feedback is going to happen. Yes. And it doesn't have to break us. And it doesn't, yeah. it, and in some ways, it might mean that we're actually doing something right. You know, if I'm mm-hmm. getting people thinking and talking about hard things, then maybe I'm doing the right thing. But it's, it's hard. It's hard to not take it personally for sure. Oh, completely. Um, that's happened to me too with some of my okay. blog posts. I notice sometimes it is easier just to put the easier ones out there that are, like I said earlier, the instructional ones. But the one I got some pushback from was um, my experience with teaching in an in inner city Title I school. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, this is my experience. I'm giving my advice and this may not work for you. But gosh, there was someone who responded and I can't remember word for word what she said, but it literally was like, she like literally reamed me a new one and I I remember I was on a date with my husband and that just like comment showed up and I I said oh that's it uh, nobody likes me and I just kind of was like oh how is she so offended I said it's my opinion why would someone be this upset about something and he was like are you seriously letting one person mm-hmm. one person and that's what he told me too he's like why don't you respond with just 
I appreciate your, you know, if she goes, if she took the time to comment, just say, I appreciate so much your feedback. Thank you so much for responding. Um, if you have any questions about what I said, or I'd love to start a dialogue, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. But it kind of put it in perspective for me because I was like, why am I letting this bother me? Mm -hmm. But I think, like you said, it's about putting yourself out there. The people who want to receive it well will, and the people who don't, then just that's okay too. And you're going to have some people, I think you're right. Like it's a sign of growth almost when you see even negative comments coming in, which is unfortunate, but um, that's going to happen. And I remember that was like my very first one. And it was like, up until then, everything had been coasting, everything was positive yeah, and yeah. yay, yay for Jessica. And then it was like, whoa, whoa, what? Someone doesn't like me. That's it. Nobody likes me. Yeah, <laughs> it's so yeah. sad. It's like, you almost derailed my whole business because of one comment. And I was like, stop it. Yeah. <laughs> so crazy. And just, I mean, we got, I've gotten comments about all sorts of things, I did just a fun, happy post about my student teacher and mentioned that she was wearing a dress from Amazon and someone got so angry that I was talking about Amazon on our oh my goodness. Them. And I was just like, oh my goodness, I don't even notice that I'm saying these things mm -hmm. and people are picking them apart with a fine tooth comb. Mm -hmm. But again, you get those positive comments. You get people emailing you saying, hey, because of you, I was able to do X, Y, and Z. And, yes. And that's why we do it. And so kind of tying it back into imposter syndrome. Yeah. It, it's, it's believing that it, something I was also thinking about is just what are we doing? You know, what is the mm -hmm. core of what we're doing? And the core of teaching music is serving, right? Mm, it's that's good. building community and it's serving. So when we're writing something, if we're writing it out of a place because we want to puff ourselves up, it's mm -hmm. never going to work out, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. at some point, our bubble is going to burst or we're going to be deflated. But if we're doing it to serve others and to build community, yeah. it doesn't matter how many people like it. It doesn't matter, you know, how many sales you get. You will positively mm -hmm. impact someone. Yeah, that's true. Let's tie this back to a teacher teaching in the classroom. Okay. I know imposter syndrome is real. And I believe I shared with you my story. Um, I know I've shared it on this podcast, but if there's a new listener, I'm just going to keep it short, sweet to the point. But I had in imposter syndrome a lot because I started in the middle of the school year and because I had no instruments, I had no curriculum. I had not built up a classroom full of whatever, um, like many of the teachers did. And so I just remember constantly comparing myself and feeling like I wasn't good enough and I didn't know who to ask for help. And so te music teachers listening to this and they're in the classroom every day teaching those kiddos and they're just like feeling like they're not good enough or they're not building up their resources enough and their instruments enough and um, whatever else they need. If they're feeling like they're not getting there fast enough and they're comparing, how would you encourage a teacher to just keep on keeping on and being true to themselves in the classroom? Yeah, that's a really good question. I can really relate to that. Like I said, I've taught so many different things and mm -hmm. I did not feel prepared to teach all the things. Everything I'm teaching today is not something I was prepared to teach, which is kind of crazy mm -hmm. to think about. But, you know, I started an orchestra program because there wasn't one and I was passionate about there being one um, in our high school, you know, day to day curriculum. And honestly, at our first orchestra rehearsal, I couldn't remember what strings were on each instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, I'm terrible at the violin, <laughs> yeah. but the viola, you know, I, I just did it cause I saw a need, but I was so ill-equipped. I couldn't figure out the notes. I mean, I tried to fake it. And what I've realized over the past few years, I've had multiple babies and I went on a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. So I've had other mm -hmm. people take over my program a few times who are much better than I am at playing stringed instruments. Mm -hmm. But my kids are so excited for me to come back because of that relationship. You know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, they don't care how well I can play a violin. They care that I am caring for them. I am helping them be a better musician. I'm providing yeah. opportunities for them. And so for those elementary teachers who are thinking, oh, I don't have my ORF certification or I don't have beautiful glockenspiels or I can never be this person who's perfectly doing this thing online. You yeah. are the best person for your kids. It's the same as yeah. being a parent, right? You oh, yeah. are in the classroom. You know your kids better than that lady does who has all of her certifications and you can love them better and you'll learn, you'll keep growing, you'll keep yep. getting better at the things you have. I think that's also hard for new teachers, right? Because we want to oh, know yeah. 
immediately, mm-hmm. but to trust that it's a process and every year you'll get better at something and every year there will be a new challenge to face. So, um, mm-hmm. just, you're the best person for your kids, hands down, whoever yeah. you are, wherever you are. Oh, I completely agree with that. Um, I have started thinking about, I am an instrumental person all the way, 100%, but same thing with strings. I actually had a band director in college tell me that getting a music ed degree, especially the instrumental track, you might one day be asked to teach orchestra. And I looked at him with like this look of panic, like, uh, uh-uh, I, I'm not a strings player, but I'm piano and clarinet. And what I'm getting at is when I got in the elementary music classroom I even thought about having imposter syndrome with your students Mm -hmm. I felt like they were thinking about me the way I was thinking about myself like they're gonna know I am not the greatest singer and they're gonna know they're gonna be like why is she even singing in here why is she the music teacher in an elementary music classroom if she don't I can match pitch but you know what I mean I'm not like I'm not vocally trained um I had to take that one I think it was one semester of vocal lessons to get my degree kind of thing but um no, the kids didn't care they didn't no. care they they were like you're in here teaching me music and you know like they hadn't had music for seven years so I got I had to like get over that myself mm-hmm. and stop thinking even the kids were judging me when they weren't um and just have confidence in my classroom and when I did that and I had confidence in my classroom with my students mm-hmm. that may be imposter syndrome so much and like you said just getting in there and showing up every day and taking one step forward and then a day and then it turns into a week and then a month that I feel like also helps you with confidence, which helps with imposter syndrome because you're kind of learning as you go. And I think a lot of teachers, especially new teachers don't realize that, like you said, they want to just have it all solved right now. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. And I think showing those areas of weakness or learning alongside is so important. And I definitely Mm -hmm. did that, do that as a new teacher. I wanted to seem like I knew everything. Um, I just had a fantastic student teacher with me the past few weeks and she's a great violinist. And she said, why don't you play my violin while I conduct? You can sit with the second violins. I am so bad at violin, but I was (laughs) like, okay, I'm going to do it. And the first day my kids said, oh my gosh, Ghoul is just playing violin. This is crazy. And it was so amazing how it changed my relationship with some of my, you know, back row players who I don't mm-hmm. get to interact with as much mm-hmm. and who kind of, I think, like to hide behind their music stand. And for me to let them be the expert, I realized when I give them instructions, they know it's not because I think it's easy or I think they should be perfect. It's yeah. because I, I want us all to grow together. And I've actually changed my philosophy a lot with that. In my guitar classes, whatever my students are working on, I always share my goal too. So I always mm-hmm. say, okay, I'm going to work on this as well. And I'll share my progress with them. I'll perform for them at the end. And like I said, I just never did that in the beginning. I was so afraid of them seeing me mess mm-hmm. up or sound bad. Mm-hmm. I felt like that too, getting into teaching. I wanted to be perfect like what I mean by that is I was like you said afraid to make a mistake I was like oh if I make a mistake then they're gonna know I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm the only music teacher in this school so I have to act like I know what I'm doing because no one else is teaching this I have to act like the expert but the kids need to see your vulnerability because I think one thing as educators you don't realize is your students are dealing with imposter syndrome every day as well Um, and so when you show them it's okay to make a mistake I'm learning Mm -hmm. from my mistakes just like you are, and we're not comparing ourselves in here to anyone else. So just being confident will show them to have confidence, which in turn will make, I don't know, just it helps everybody all around. (laughs) And how about do-overs? You saying that makes me think about Mm -hmm. having a lesson flop, and instead of trying to pretend it never happened, (laughs) going back to that group of kids and saying, hey, last Mm -hmm. week we tried doing this, and it didn't really work well. Why do you think, or I have a new idea to try it again. Let's do it again. But I think so often we try something once and if it doesn't go well, we, you know, it affects us personally and we're not willing to try it again. So I think Mm -hmm. that would be helpful for teachers too, to think about how can you bring your students into the conversation about areas where as a class you're struggling or things that didn't quite work right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, imposter syndrome could be something we talked about forever because it is a loaded topic. I just want listeners to realize that we all deal with it 
I didn't say dealt to deal with it. We all, we all have feelings of it. It comes and goes. And it's something that I feel like it's just part of it. And you'll, um, but just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Like I said, because it does get easier. You'll just learn to be confident in who you are as a person. Um, before we go, I did as uh, author questions, I forgot to ask you a couple things. I want to go back to that. I know we're kind of skipping around a little bit, but I kind of wanted to ask this before we go. Um, when it comes to writing a book, so mm-hmm. your, I want you to talk a little bit about your company and your mission behind that with writing eBooks and how important that is and how that would definitely help a teacher. Um, what am I trying to say with, if they're growing a business, but even to their students or to just kind of picking a topic and putting themselves out there. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about your company and what you, your mission is behind that. Okay, thanks. So um, I took a year long sabbatical last year. I'll give a little bit of history into how this came to be. And I had to propose a few different projects. One of the projects was for me to write my guitar curriculum into a book. And Mm. I was going to go the traditional publishing route, but I couldn't find a publisher that would present my materials as e-materials as well. So I have YouTube videos um, for beginning guitarists. I also have lots of worksheets and Google documents. And so I wanted sort of a living document online where people who bought my book could interact with those links and it could be more of an interactive experience. And I just didn't find a publisher that was willing to do that. And also uh, for those listeners who've never published before, uh, traditional royalties and academic publishing are terrible. So it's mm. between three and 5%. Um, you know, the first book that I wrote that I was talking about earlier, yeah. I might get a $6 royalty check once a year from that. So, oh, okay. and, and you're also giving your entire content over to the company. So you don't get to own mm. any of it. So our heart behind starting F Up Books was for a few things. We wanted to empower people to be authors. Um, We didn't want to put barriers in place where you had to have a PhD to be an author with an academic publishing company. Um, And we wanted to provide unique supports that you might not get in on a platform such as Teachers Pay Teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So we wanted Mm -hmm. to really support music educators specifically and have them create content that could be interactive. Um, You know, some of our eBooks are more traditional, so there's not a lot of links in them, but some of our other books are highly interactive and you buy the book, you also get put in a Facebook group. You also get um, collaborative Dropbox folders that you can put materials into. And I just love that type of forward thinking where you're not just purchasing um, content that's static, you're purchasing dynamic content. And uh, we also cared strongly about authors getting paid. So our authors get 70% royalties from any sale that they make. And we try to price everything affordably. So if you're a teacher, you're able to actually buy it and use it in your classroom. So you could buy a book and tomorrow be teaching a lesson from the book that you bought using the YouTube videos, using the Google docs and editing Mm -hmm. them from yourself. Yeah. That's kind of it in a nutshell. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. I love that because um, I just love your mission in starting this company. And when I found you on Instagram, I was like, oh my gosh, like not just because I had an interest in writing a book, but because of everything you just said, music teachers, even looking for resources, teacher pay teacher is a great platform. But like you said, um, having an ebook that you can go through that contains links and then um, other resources in the book for you to use as well is, um, I might've said resources twice. I can't remember, but that's an, I think that's an amazing route to go to. And so it's also educators helping educators and which is a good thing as well um but yeah so someone wanting to write an ebook i think having your company there to help them and guide them is such a good thing because someone like me who has no idea what i'm doing Mm -hmm. um it's just something that is so needed i feel like because i just know there's so many teachers out there listening to this that are just like i have something to say i don't know how but and i don't know if i'd be good enough at it but just encouraging them that, yes, you do. Just Mm -hmm. putting yourself out there is the first step. Yeah, and I think you have your experience. Some people are overwhelmed by the mechanics of writing, Mm -hmm. and there's some great resources for that. If you just don't feel that strong of a writer grammatically or 
structurally, we could call it. Um, there's some great resources. I can share them with you that you could link in your show. Yeah. Notes, but, oh, totally. Um, there's even a book that I use sometimes called Simple, Brief, and Precise that was written by one of uh, my former professors. And there's a literally a list in the back of the book that says, don't say this, say this. Mm. And sometimes I will go through my writing and just do a word search and swap things out. I mean, oh, yeah. it seems kind of silly, but you know, you don't know your own sort of idiosyncrasies sometimes when it comes to writing. So just having something that's objective and easy for editing, I think is really helpful too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's some great books out there that can serve as guides, but definitely don't let the mechanics keep you from writing content because content is really what is needed and the mechanics mm -hmm. can be taught and they can also be edited. So you can work mm -hmm. with a great editor who can help you, um, help you speak and say the things that you're trying to say. Okay. That makes sense. So those listening today, if you have a book on your heart or something to say, and you think I'm not good enough, who would want to hear what I have to say, or this topic's already been done, but it hasn't been done in your voice. And so we need what you have to say. And also, if you're listening today and you feel like you have been battling imposter syndrome, whether it is with writing or in teaching, then know that you, you can do it. You, you've got this. You are the person you are meant to be. And we are both cheering you on. Um, so, Sarah, before we go, do you have any other advice about anything we talked about today or any advice in general for elementary music teachers listening in? Yeah, so we're in sort of a strange spot in education right now because of a lot mm -hmm. of teachers being displaced and moving their content online. In a recent blog post, I mentioned don't be distracted by shiny objects. And I think what I mean by that is it's very easy to see what everyone else is doing and to yeah. ask if I'm doing enough. And again, this goes back to imposter syndrome, but specifically with online learning, don't forget to focus on connecting with students first and foremost. And that could even just be a chat, <laughs> you know, that mm -hmm. could even just be a zoom chat or an email or a check-in with parents even, you know, I think it's easy to think that we're not doing everything we should be curriculum wise. And to remember that connection should always come before curriculum. Oh, totally. Yeah. With the coronavirus right now, we are mm -hmm. recording this as it basically schools have just started closing recently um, in, well, in my area. But I know I know there's a couple of teachers even inside my membership site who they are um, one of them's in South Korea and his school closed in January. So it's been a while. But um, I know th that it is like a like you said like just something totally new and strange for a lot of teachers teaching virtually but I like that you said that going back to connecting with your students um I've even today saw a teacher that did a kind of like a zoom call and just invited any of her students to come on and sing a song that could like mm -hmm. if you're available come on and let's just sing together and make music it doesn't need to be that it could just be as simple like you said as emailing a parent and because parents you and I are both moms we know that this is a whole new world for both of us too um, on the parent side of things and so parents would love any teacher to reach out and just say how are you doing are you hanging in there do you need any help or support so yeah. um, which in the flip side you're also reaching out to the kiddos as well mm -hmm. um, but yeah I love that advice um, Sarah I have enjoyed this conversation so very much and I appreciate you being a guest before we go I would love for you to let anybody know where they can connect with you on social media or your website or anywhere else great thank you this was so wonderful so I in terms of social media I'm primarily on Instagram Instagram. You can find us at F flat books. Um, we all know F flat is the enharmonic equivalent of E. So that's <laughs> ebooks, but F flat books. And then our website is F flat dash books.com. Okay, awesome. And I will definitely include both of those links in the show notes. And Sarah, thank you so much for being a guest. Like I said, I've enjoyed having you. This is long overdue. Um, this conversation has been, I think, needed and it's going to be a breath of fresh air. So thank you for being thank on. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, I would love for you to review the show and leave a rating on iTunes. 
To find out more about how I can help you gain momentum in your elementary music teaching career, head to thedomesticmusician.com where you'll find free downloads, courses, the blog, and so much more. Continue teaching music and never doubt the impact you're making each and every day in the lives of your students.